Hi, hello colleagues. Um, I hope you can hear as well. Uh, this is Jose Gesti. Um, I'm working in UNICEF headquarters uh, supporting the work on was climate resilience. Um, we are recording this presentation as of now, so we will make it available on the SharePoint slider for you if uh, you want to come back to it or for colleagues that haven't been able to join. So thanks very much for joining us uh, this evening. Well, this night for, for us, I believe, is for most of you is uh, afternoon. Um, this is the official launch of our Climate Resilience Programming Guidance for Country Offices. Um, and we're doing this launching now that we have finalized all the, um, the materials and guidance notes uh, that support the, the strategic framework for was climate resilience that um, most of you may be already familiar with. But as I said, we have now completed the, all the guidance that support the implementation of the framework, and we are making uh, all the materials available in the link that we share with you with the invitation and that it will be presented later uh, as part of this presentation. We hope you find this uh, session useful. Um, this is a joint uh, webinar between UNICEF and the Global Water Partnership, GWP. Indeed, we have some colleagues from uh, GWP uh, joining uh, this presentation uh, now. Uh, I have to say that, that we've been working hard uh, from our side, you know, at the global level uh, together with GWP uh, and in consultation with, with uh, some of you uh, at the regional and country offices. Um, and this work has extended over uh, the last few years. Um, the materials that we have developed, we really believe, uh, are in response to, to requests coming from, from you colleagues in the field. Um, and trying to address questions and to to uh, really uh, provide a little bit uh, coherent approach to the integration of climate resilience into the water sanitation and hygiene programming. Um, so today um, on our call, as I said, we have uh, colleagues uh, from the Global Water Partnership that will be uh, also presenting part of the content of this presentation. We have our colleagues Arman Huijan and Sarah Oppenheimer. Arman is um, from um, joining from GWP offices in, in um, West Africa, and Sarah is joining from headquarters, uh, GWP headquarters in, in Stockholm. For UNICEF colleagues, uh, to let you know that, uh, in case that you uh, didn't know, GWP, the Global Water Partnership, is an organization which is really at the forefront of was uh, climate resilience, climate resilience in general, dealing with the broader water agenda. Um, for us, it's been really a great opportunity to be able to uh, UNICEF to partner with uh, and collaborate with, uh, with GWP in this uh, important uh, journey. So a big thank you uh, to GWP colleagues for working with us and to, you know, jointly uh, with us developing the materials, the guidance materials that are going to be presented today. Also, we want to take the opportunity to um, to thank uh, other partners such as the Overseas Development Institute and uh, the consultancy firm HR Wallingford which have been uh, instrumental in developing the, the technical briefs and the guidance that, that you will see uh, later on in this presentation. Also, uh, with me from uh, UNICEF in headquarters, um, we have Emily Bamford, who is a WASP climate change specialist, as I said, working uh, with me here in, in New York. And we also have colleagues from the Climate Unit in the Division of uh, Policy, Research, and Planning. These colleagues, um, Raksa and Christina, they will be uh, making a presentation. This time it will be Christina uh, towards the end of our presentation. Um, um, and they will explain this. These colleagues work uh, with the Climate Unit uh, at the corporate level, and they overlook um, uh, programming in general and strategic um, advice at the corporate level uh, beyond WASH. 
Emily and myself, we are uh, within the program division and we work in the WASH section in headquarters. Um, so I think we can get started. Um, what you see now is uh, the outline of the, um, of the presentation. Um, we have an introduction, a short introduction that I will be making, explaining the impacts of WAS and climate, um, the impacts of climate change on, on climate variability on, on WAS very quickly. We will then move to uh, a few slides on the strategic framework on WAS climate resilience. Again, you may be familiar already with, but we will refresh. Then our colleagues in GWP will go over the slides that present the, the different guidance notes and technical briefs. Um, and then we will have Emily presenting a few examples of WAS climate resilient WAS programming, just, you know, to spice a little bit the, the, the presentation with, with tangible examples on, on things that are already happening. And then Christina will uh, close um, the, the main part of the presentation with, um, with a few slides um, on WASP climate resilient funding opportunities. So, uh, again, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, UNICEF and GWP, we've been working together for a few years, since 2014. Um, again, for UNICEF colleagues, you know, to remind you that the Global Water Partnership is really at the forefront of climate resilience uh, globally. Um, and it's also very much involved in issues that relate to integrated water resources management and transboundary cooperation. Um, GWP has indeed played a key role in supporting the post-2015 development agenda and also the global dialogue on water security and sustainable growth. Kind of uh, similar to the way we are, uh, we have um, our UNICEF set up, uh, GWP, uh, they also have their uh, headquarter office, which is in uh, Stockholm, and they have 13 regional uh, water partnerships and also 86 country water partnerships worldwide. And uh, we have to say that GWP at the country level works almost in all the countries where UNICEF has a WASP programming uh, right now. Also, uh, for our GWP colleagues joining, to in case that you didn't know, UNICEF, in UNICEF we work in more than 100 uh, countries globally, um, supporting programs uh, that really bring safe water, sanitation, and hygiene for millions of people. Um, climate resilience is uh, is a major priority for us, and it's a real uh, is, and it's a very important pillar of the new uh, UNICEF was a strategy that, as you um, know, goes from, uh, from 2016 to 2030. Um, as I've been mentioning, the collaboration has really uh, happened uh, at the moment at the global level, uh, developing, you know, with GWP, also with uh, ODI and HR Walling for the, the thinking uh, again in consultation with you. This is not been uh, this is not a top-down approach to where we are trying to impose any uh, strategy. But you know, very much believe uh, it has been developed um, as a as a response uh, to demands from from your colleagues in the in the field offices. Um, but the collaboration really it's it's already moving from the global level to regional and country levels. Um, we have had already an interesting collaboration at the regional level with the West Africa region. Uh, we have conducted assessments, making use of the, of the guidance that is going to be presented later. Uh, we have made assess assessments for um, 11 country uh, offices in, in West Africa, and we presented uh, the results of these assessments in a joint full-day workshop uh, between um, GWP and UNICEF in Dakar in uh, September. This is really leading into um, country action plans, country, country offices having a little bit of a better idea on how to integrate climate resilience. Uh, this is indeed leading to uh, UNICEF and GWP collaborating at the country level in places such as um, Cameroon, where a PCA has been already signed between uh, UNICEF and GWP Cameroon. Um, also, another PCA is underway uh, in Madagascar country office between um, 
between UNICEF and GWP. And in Mauritania as well, there are prospects for um, another country collaboration. So this is a little bit the essence. Now that the materials and the framework are out there, uh, our efforts are concentrated in, in providing technical support to the regions and countries so that the collaboration between UNICEF and GWP can cascade down um, to the very practical level of the implementation of the framework in um, uh, the country level. So we move now into the part where I'm going to be making a short intro to climate change and was. Uh, this uh, slide is taken uh, is taken from uh, from the strategic framework. That is a table that uh, some of you may be already familiar with. Um, as you probably already know, the main impacts of climate change are first and foremost felt through water. Um, water scarcity, drought, um, predictable rainfall, flooding, high temperatures, sea level rise. All of these. Um, are having already an impact, um, and, and we will, and it will continue to have a, an impact on wash services. Um, some of the impacts are, are more obvious, like obviously, I mean, it's pretty obvious. If there is less precipitation, there is less water for supply, and therefore, you know, um, the water supply services are constrained. But there are also, uh, we also need to pay attention to to other things that may be not so immediate to us such as, you know, the impacts of flooding on um, behavioral approaches to total sanitation, you know. Um, we believe that recurrent flooding or increasing frequency of flood events, um, you know, may pose a, a negative impact on, on behavioral change and make, make um, can make, you know, the sustainability of, uh, of our cuts, uh, community approaches to total sanitation interventions more challenging. So just uh, that we are aware of this, and then we think, um, you know, if it's the case that we are um, leading with um, with um, recurrent flooding, um, you know, to 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 take the necessary steps to make um, the community approaches to total sanitation more resilient. This is a figure that is taken from the report "Thirsting for a Future." that we launched um, last year for World Water Day. It's been a very successful uh, report that it's, it's been used in many different forums um, to highlight the impacts of, uh, of uh, climate resilience on children through um, wash services and the impact that climate change has on wash services. Um, here you have also the, the link to the report that you can check out uh, after this presentation if, if you like. And we, you know, we, uh, we already know that some of the colleagues are, um, you know, are using some of the figures such as the one presented here, you know, to make your own presentations and we really invite you to take a look. There are very interesting figures that you can use, you know, when you have uh, meetings or discussions with partner colleagues or, um, you know, um, to discuss issues around the impacts of climate change on, on water services. Um, basically, what we see in the figure is how climate change affects children, both directly and indirectly, and this happens in, in many different ways. Um, from the, the more obvious ones, such as dehydration and malnutrition, right through the, the reduction in sanitation and hygiene practices, and also the reduction in, in water quality which we, of course, we know this uh, leads to an increase uh, of vector-borne and, uh, and infectious diseases. So now we, I will be presenting, um, again, you know, uh, something that some of you, uh, uh, you are already familiar with, which is the strategic framework for was climate resilience. Um, just to say that we have, uh, many of you may have already seen the, the, the first version that it was published. We have now uh, launched a second edition of it that comes with some improvements and that I'm going to be presenting uh, now. Um, again, you know, when talking about the strategic framework, we always like to say that this is, this is a framework that is really aiming at providing colleagues in the field and in country offices and, and also sector partners with uh, guidance on how to effectively implement WASP climate resilience programming. So um, 
the framework uh, is a very simple framework and it's really aiming at providing, as I said, you know, the sector, the WAS sector with a basic tool, um, a tool that can be easily followed and, and that it can somehow help us bring in coherence to, to sometimes existing but dispersed was climate resilience uh, development programming. So, you know, this was one of the main objectives, you know, when, when we thought about developing this framework, we, we saw different kind of scatter interventions in, in a little bit sometimes ad hoc interventions, and we uh, hope that this framework is really, um, you know, bringing a little bit coherence and, and bringing together uh, within a framework, you know, uh, where it could otherwise be dispersed um, kind of interventions. So, in agreement with the results framework that uh, the, this document is introducing now, uh, in the second edition, um, you know, um, we, what, what the, the framework is really after and the focus is on, on, on two main things. The first one is uh, ensuring that was infrastructure and services are sustainable and resilient to climate-related re risk. This is the first thing. So the WAS services are resilient. But secondly, uh, this is about ensuring that a resilient WAS um, service is also contributing to helping uh, build uh, community resilience to the impact of climate change. So we see this different or kind of a dual um, outcome out of implementing this framework. Um, more resilient uh, WAS services and WAS services that support resilience at the community level. So this framework, uh, as I said, is a very basic framework and it has four different areas of intervention. The first one is understanding the problem, which uh, includes uh, understanding what are the risks and the impacts of, uh, of climate change um, in the WAS uh, sector. This is something that, for example, um, the Nepal country office, our colleagues in Nepal country offices, are very much going through now. They, they, uh, they've been conducting a, a sector-wide uh, study to understand the impacts of climate change um, on WAS services. Other country offices in different regions have also gone this way. It's not just only understanding the impacts of climate change, uh, on the WAS services or climate variability on the WAS services is also understanding who are the partners that we can work with and that can help us, you know, to move in this agenda. Uh, it's also understanding what are the national priorities uh, that have been already established to um, to uh, to move with with climate resilience in in the particular context uh, that we operate. So this is about understanding the problem. To support the implementation of this part of the framework, we have a, a guidance note, which is called uh, Risk Assessments for WAS. Um, and, and GWP colleagues will talk a little bit more uh, about this, uh, each of these technical briefs. The second part of the framework is identifying and appraising options. And here we have two technical briefs that support this part of the implementation. A technical brief that is uh, one of the stars of, uh, you know, of this collaboration. Uh, that really comes with, with different options, you know, uh, at different levels, as we are going to see, national, subnational, and local levels, but with a kind of a long list of, of, of options that you can consider, um, you know, for integrating in your own um, programming. Um, the third part of the framework is about delivering solutions, and here we also have two technical briefs that support implementation. Um, a technical brief on modified water safety planning uh, and also a technical brief that supports the uh, process to integrate climate resilience into water sector strategies and plans. And finally, we have the fourth part of uh, or the fourth quadrant of the framework, which is monitoring and moving forward. And here we have developed um, a technical brief on climate resilient was monitoring and evaluation with a, a long list of potential indicators that this will be presented later. So, uh, as I said, what is new in the, the new edition of the, um, the second edition of the framework includes now this. Uh, obviously, you cannot read on the on the on this uh, slide, but hopefully, it will um, make you curious enough to go to the new edition of the framework and take a further look. I'm going to present a little bit in more detail, just at, at this point, and when we cannot read what is on the screen, but just to highlight the different colors. Uh, 
um, relating to the different uh, level of interventions. So what you see on top is what I was mentioning before, the outcome of this results framework is the dual uh, focus that we have on strengthening the services and through what services providing um, resilience to the communities. And then we are looking at intermediate outcomes at three different levels, at the national level, at the sub-national level, and at the local and project level. For each of them, we have a set of outputs, expected outputs, and the related activities to get to those um, outputs, intermediate outcomes, and finally, out outcome. So just in a little bit more uh, detail, the same that we were looking uh, before, again, to emphasize that when we are uh, looking at integrating climate resilience into what's programming, we're just not looking at the infrastructure level, at the local level, and looking, you know, only at, um, you know, at a raised latrine or um, a deeper borehole or something that it's the most obvious solution. You know, not, it's not just only about the infrastructure at the project level. We are actually really looking to reinforce uh, the enabling environment at the national level in a way that is conducive to climate resilient water services. Also at the sub-national or water set level, we are looking at water resources to be monitored and managed in a way that they are considering climate risk to water services and infrastructure. And finally, at the local and project level, we are looking at um, access to climate resilient was infrastructure and also climate resilient behavioral change and governance as well at the community and local levels. So for, I will give the floor now to uh, our GWP colleagues. I believe it's going to be Sara or Armand, uh, I believe Sara, um, who is uh, going to be talking from Stockholm. It's seven o'clock in the morning there. Um, so if you are ready, Sara, you can you can start. Um. Hello. Yes. Good morning for, and good afternoon for for all of you. Uh, I hope you can you can hear me well. So I will be, as Jose said, I will be introducing a little bit the guidance we've developed. Uh, as as Jose mentioned, we've been working hard from from UNICEF and from GWP to finalize a complete set of tools and technical guidance for the effective implementation of WASH climate resilience programming. Um, just for you to know, part of this guidance has been translated uh, in case you're interested in French, Spanish and Portuguese. A set of learning modules was also prepared for capacity building. It's available now and it will be used for a course that we will carry out together with CatNet, which will be uh, announced in, in May. Um, so let's review quickly the available guidance materials that support the implementation of the framework. Uh, to support the first area of work, uh, understanding the problem, one of the most important steps is to carry out a WASH climate risk assessment. So this will allow you to prioritize support for the most vulnerable populations and to have the biggest impact. It can, be, it can be carried out by reviewing existing materials, such as national adaptation programs of action and country-specific research and data, and by convening WASH and climate partners within the country to verify this information and plan for the next steps. Uh, we have developed a guidance note which proposes a methodology to carry out such an assessment. And just please note that this guidance note can be used to assess risks that go beyond climate risks, but can also be used with a specific focus on climate. The methodology, as you, it, it's been, uh, sorry, the methodology is aligned and, and complements other UNICEF corporate guidance on risk informed programming. And as you see in the slide, it allows to, to map hazards, exposures, vulnerabilities, and capacities, which is important uh, in order to start appraising the WASH climate resilient options and prioritize the most vulnerable areas for support. Um, we have also developed an Excel spreadsheet, and that will facilitate you to score these hazards, exposures, vulnerability, and capacity. And this is ready to use, and it's available. Uh, in case you need any technical support, please just reach out to UNICEF or, or us at GWP, and, and feel free to, to ask us any question you, you might have. 
Uh, the second technical briefs go, goes to more uh, programming detail. It focuses on spe specific technologies and capacity building options for WASH climate resilience. It's a very comprehensive uh, publication, so we really encourage you to, to go and have a look. Uh, it discusses how to screen technologies for climate risk, to how to str uh, strengthen standards and build the capacity of water resources monitoring and management. It also delves into more detail on specific technology options for implementing WASH climate resilient programs. For example, uh, it, it, it goes into water storage options, climate smart technologies such as solar power sis uh, water systems, or diversification and decentralization of services. Um, the third technical brief uh, provides guidance on how to design your project or program, in particular in terms of technologies that you choose to use after you've explored the possibilities with a previous publication. Uh, it provides a, this one provides a simple scorecard or checklist, if you will, which can be used to identify and prioritize the most appropriate options for each pro project implementation area. So it takes into account communities' needs over the next 15 to 20 years and ensure, to ensure truly sustainable wash climate uh, resilient options for communities in the medium to long term. The, the next uh, publication explores how to integrate climate resilience into national WASH strategies and plans. Uh, the brief proposes that such process starts with the integration of already identified WASH climate resilience priorities with the development of a good risk analysis and the adoption of approaches that make WASH services more resilient and adaptable to climate change. Uh, this publication provides very concrete steps uh, in order to make this happen. So as I understand, for UNICEF colleagues, uh, you have an advantage because the process has already begun in some countries, such as Rwanda and Nepal, for example. And in addition, it's aligned with your UNICEF strategic plan, which includes the following WASH indicator, uh, countries integrating climate change and or risk management strategies into WASH sector and plans. So this shows that it's a real priority for UNICEF, and it's, of course, a priority for, for all of us. Um, the fifth technical brief provides guidance on how to implement climate resilient water safety plans at the local level, with particular focus on climate resilience. It uh, specifically provides guidance on simplified water resource assessments, environment and climate hazard assessments at the community level, and how we can work with communities in order to identify and sustain uh, climate resilient options. And the very last uh, technical brief is on how to set up uh, indicators. Uh, sorry, on how to set up indicators, how to identify and, and monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of measures introduced to enhance climate resilience and their contribution to the overall sustainability of WASH services. Uh, the brief focuses on the additionality that climate resilience monitoring and evaluation introduces when incorporated into existing m &E systems, and it provides examples of typical monitoring indicators that can be used and or adapted where, where needed. Uh, the brief also summarizes the factors to consider in monitoring climate resilience, and it suggests ways to address these challenges. So just for you to know, we, we just launched our, our new website. So now here, so all the technical briefs that I've presented are there, the learning modules as well. Um, so now with this website, you have everything you need in terms of programming guidance for, for WASH Climate Resilience. Uh, so feel free to visit this website, and we hope you will like it. And with this, I would like to give the floor back to, to New York, to Emily, for hearing about practical examples. Thank you very much. Colleagues, can you hear me? OK, 
Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, so many of our country offices have actually already begun implementing various elements of WASH Climate Resilient Programming. And there are various technology options available for doing this. Sarah just went over a few of them which are available in the options brief. Um, but I'm just going to go over a few examples um, of the great initiatives that we have going on um, in some of our country offices. So firstly, at the national level, um, we have a great example from Ethiopia where they're currently using remote sensing to search for water um, in some of the country's most drought-prone drought regions. And in 2016, I'm sure many of you are aware, Ethiopia experienced one of the worst droughts in decades when the rains failed. Um, but UNICEF Ethiopia and the government were well prepared for this because back in 2015, they'd begun piloting the use of remote sensing techniques. And remote sensing, if you're not familiar with it, basically combines satellite earth scanning techniques with hydrogeological investigation in order to find water that's located deep in the ground. And this is basically used to create a groundwater suitability map, which is then combined with a needs assessment in order to prioritize locations for drilling. And um, before this remote sensing took place, drilling success rates for the program stood at around 50%. But now, as a result of the remote sensing, they've shot up to 92%, which is a huge increase. And this has meant that UNICEF has um, saved a lot of money, and it now means they can reach a lot more people with the money saved. I think, as it stands, the program has reached about half a million people, and they're about to scale it up to another 39 districts in the coming year. So what's great about this, the water systems provided is um, they're also sufficient to support livestock and livelihoods, which really help to further strengthen um, the community's physical and economic resilience to drought and climate change. So other great ways to improve um, climate resilience within communities um, is to diversify water supply options and ensure backup options in particular. For example, improving water storage, etc. Um, so an example is Cambodia. And many people living in rural communities rely on shallow dug wells, um, which have a tendency to dry up during the dry season. So as a result, um, communities are using rainwater, rainwater harvesting techniques um, combined with the treatment of surface water sources as a backup supply option to use during the dry season. And then when it begins raining again, they um, revert back to using the shallow dug wells. And rainwater harvesting has obviously been around for a while um, and is used in many regions, particularly, um, for example, Uganda, where rainfall is very heavy. And solar-powered water systems are also another great example um, of WASH climate resilient technology and also a green technology. Um, and these systems are at the moment being used in about 35 UNICEF country offices at the moment. And we found that um, when dimensioned correctly, the systems can store enough water to last for several days, which helps provide a buffer, particularly during periods of intense cloud cover or system malfunction. And we recently carried out a global solar-powered water system assessment here in New York. Um, and we basically found that these systems are highly durable and sustainable when they're sited and dimensioned correctly, much more so than hand pumps or motorized systems, etc. And the great thing about them is as well that they're highly cost effective for the community in the long term as they break down much less and they don't require expensive fuel supply like mechanized systems. So another great method of improving safe water storage for climate resilience is managed aquifer recharge. And one of the first countries, one of our first country offices to implement this was Bangladesh. Um, and Bangladesh is basically using the approach to address the issue of saltwater intrusion, which is being caused by rising sea levels, which have been caused by climate change. 
and managed aquifer recharge basically uses a combination of rainwater harvesting and treated pond water and this is pumped through a sand filter um, to form a bubble which is located deep in the ground um, and because this is underground it's basically protected from contamination and evaporation particularly during the dry season and is basically allowed able to provide safe water to communities throughout the whole year. So in terms of sanitation, um, we're starting to see several CATS programs. This is CLTS, Community-Led Total Sanitation, for our colleagues from GWP who might be on the call today. Um, and we're seeing this in places such as Pakistan, where CATS has basically been tailored to meet the needs of communities who are now experiencing an increased incidence of flooding as a result of climate change. And there are many elements to the approach. One of them includes hazard risk mapping at the river basin and community levels. And the approach also aims to ensure adequate drainage and wastewater treatment within communities. And of course, communities are encouraged to build flood resilient latrines. And here you can see a great example of a raised and sealed latrine. Um, and we're seeing similar approaches being used in other countries around the world at the moment who are flood prone, for example, Peru and Ghana. So there are a lot, lots of great things happening in terms of sanitation and climate resilience at the moment. And finally, um, the use of multi-use systems is now being um, used in many countries in order to provide resilience in particular against drought. And one example of this can be seen in southern Madagascar. And the idea with uh, multi-use multi systems is instead of providing enough water just for direct consumption within that provides enough water to support people's water livelihood needs. And the idea is that you, if you can provide enough water for agriculture and livestock cultivation and other businesses, you can also help reduce poverty and improve a community's overall resilience to climate change. And what's great about these systems is um, they've been found to help diversify children's diets, improve the health and nutrition um, because more food's available, more finances are available um, for the family, particularly in a drought situation. Um, so obviously they have a very positive impact on children. In Madagascar, the systems have been managed by water and they've been found to be highly sustainable from a financial point of view as people are much more willing to pay for the water services because um, the water directly affects household income generation. And at the same time, there's also really strong demand to sustain these services and make repairs rapidly if they break down, because again, it has a direct impact on household income. So I'm now going to hand over to Christina from our Data Research and Policy Division here in New York. Um, she's going to talk about some of the opportunities which are available to access major climate funding for WASH resilience. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, Christina, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Great. So good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, so I am the climate policy and finance um, at HQ. Um, we have a small climate team in HQ that is supporting um, the organization and moving the climate agenda forward. Um, in terms of WASH climate resilience um, programming, there's a lot of financing out there in the global landscape. Um, that's something that we're not usually um, aware of or taking ad um, advantage of, and it's something that would um, really help us as an organization in, in moving this forward. So I'm going to be talking about uh, today a little bit about what those opportunities are. Um, if we think about cl um, global climate finance in general, it's been increasing over the last several years. Um, its, it's highlight was in 2015, where we had over $400 billion in global climate finance being dispersed. Um, and this, of course, is not only public finance, but only also 
private sector finance. Um, it fell slightly um, in 2016, um, but this is due to um, technology costs, especially solar, which are going down. Um, but as you can see, we're still almost at $400 um, billion, which is obviously sizable. If we think about how it's been breaking, how it's breaking down, um, the finance is going towards mitigation, which means low carbon development alternatives. But a sizable amount is adaptation. Um, and over 50% of that actually goes to the water sector, which is something that obviously works in our favor. The other thing is that the global climate funds have been um, criticized heavily um, for not giving enough money to adaptation. So the, the effort is that over the next several years, funding will actually increase um, for adaptation, which is, which is great for us. Um, in addition to the water sector, um, there's also money that's being invested in policy and capacity de development, which is something that also works to UNICEF's um, favor. If we think about the distribution um, regionally, East Asia and Pacific actually um, has benefited the most. Um, East Asia remains the largest destination for climate finance at 132 billion a year, or 32% of that that was spent in 2015-2016. South Asia had the largest increase over the last year, and they are at 22 billion. Um, so is UNICEF taking advantage of this? Have we been able to capitalize on, on this financing? And the answer is that actually we haven't. Um, and this is something that we're working on. In terms of the funding that's out there on the public multilateral side, there are basically three main funding me mechanisms. There's the Global Environment Facility, um, which is the, the oldest um, public uh, multilateral fund. It doesn't only invest in climate and invest in biodiversity um, and other types of environmental projects. Um, and it's mobilized over $15 billion um, over the last 20 years or so that it's been in, in existence. Um, UNICEF, um, in the last year, was able to successfully partner with UNDP in Madagascar, actually, um, in order to access some of the funding through the Global Environment Facility. Um, and it's uh, the project that you see listed there. Um, the other big player on the scene is the Green Climate Fund. Um, it's the one that everyone speaks about um, that became operational in 2015. It has over uh, $10 billion um, pledged. 53 projects have been approved so far. Uh, the bulk in Asia Pacific, 22. And the breakdown um, is 40% for mitigation, so low carbon, 31% adaptation, and 29% cross-cutting. Um, of the adaptation, um, over $1 billion has been invested in the water sector. And the types of projects that they are funding are things such as scaling up climate resilient water management practices, um, urban water supply and wastewater management, and integrated water management approaches. So very much the type of activities um, and approaches that we're also promoting in the Climate Resilient WASH framework. Um, in t uh, the third player is the Adaptation Fund. And this one is um, only on adaptation, um, $460 million mobilized over the last um, 10 years. Now, in order to access this funding, um, you need to be an accredited entity. Um, and unfortunately, UNICEF is not an accredited entity um, yet. We are in the process of seeking accreditation to the Green Climate Fund. Um, we did submit an, an application um, in 2016. They've come back with many questions, and we're in the process of trying to answer those questions, because it's quite 
um, a comprehensive um, application process. The Global Environment Facility um, is not accepting um, newly accredited entities at this stage. Um, and the Adaptation Fund is, um, and that's something that we're considering potentially once we get accreditation to the Green Climate Fund, easing into the Adaptation Fund. But although we're not accredited, that doesn't prevent us from partnering with those that are accredited. And that means that we can partner with not only um, other multilaterals, other UN agencies who are accredited, but also national entities, because direct access to these funds by national entities is one of the priority areas for these funds. And many times, these national entities are actually looking for good proposals. So if we support them in developing these good proposals, then we can um, you know, access funding um, through that mechanism. So what do we need to do in order to be able to you know, um, access the funding, not only in terms of becoming accredited, but also submitting the right type of uh, proposals for these funds? One thing that we need to do is make sure that the requirements that, that are needed, we fulfill them. Um, and that we build our track record in terms of um, the climate resilient um, funding um, mechanisms. And the first thing is um, environmental and social safeguards. Um, many of you might have heard of this. I've been in, in touch with some of your offices in terms of piloting the draft environmental and social safeguards that UNICEF has. Um, it's a screening procedure that looks at various environmental, social um, standards and whether we um, uh, comply with them. It gives a risk factor and what is um, what can we do to mitigate those those risk factors. Gender mainstreaming is high on the agenda of all these funds. Um, we need to make sure that. Um, we start addressing climate change in our CPD uh, pr processes, that we have very um, robust project and program management standards in place, that we have very good monitoring and evaluation. So you know, what, is, what has been the impact of our programming activities to date? Um, how do they um, contribute to climate co-benefits? Um, you know, what's the SDG um, alignment as well. These are all things that will make our um, proposals um, much more robust and have a, a stronger chance of getting approved um, because the approval process for, for, for uh, proposals um, is also quite um, rigorous. And then we need to, you know, know the climate land finance landscape in the countries that we work. You know, we need to build relationships with the national climate focal points, which are the ministries that are being involved in, in um, executing climate finance. All of these funds have national designated authorities who are the ones who um, give the OK for proposals going through. We need to build partnerships with um, our sister agencies in country, see how, um, how we can perhaps leverage um, our expertise in the water sector um, um, and, and be able to um, um, you know, uh, make sure that, that our expertise doesn't get overlooked. Um, and, and this would give us the opportunity, as we're waiting for accreditation, to gain this experience and then uh, make it easier once, once the accreditation comes to submit proposals. Um, and, and finally, don't it's not only about the multilateral um, entities. It's also m much of our um, um, largest donors, bilateral donors, are also heavily involved in funding climate um, resilience projects. And so we need to look at them for opportunities as well um, as, as the private sector in terms of moving our agenda forward. Um, 
So um, I think this is just a brief overview. Um, we at HQ um, stand ready to support you on, on this, and we're available to answer any questions that you may have, whether it's related specifically to um, accreditation issues, proposal development entry points, or what, what partnerships you could uh, potentially begin um, to explore um, to get ready for this. And, and it, it's, um, it's exciting times, and I think it's something that um, you know, we, we should um, be excited about and, and, and move forward on it. So, so that's it from my side um, at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, we just have uh, uh, one final uh, slide that I will be talking to, and then uh, we're already trying to answer questions in the chat box, but again, you know, if you have any question, um, we are running out of time as we want to close uh, to the hour, but we could always follow up with you via email. So the last slide of this uh, presentation is uh, perhaps about what comes after this. Um, first, I wanted to start with uh, with our view from from headquarters on on, on you know uh, what is going to come after what we have presented. Uh, you know, you've seen that this website has been very much sharing with you, not in detail because obviously there is a lot of guidance materials uh, and we could spend hours. Um, but we wanted you to be aware of what is the guidance there and, you know, to invite you to, to get familiar with the website and with the, with the documents that we have already posted there. But from our side, you know, we want to take this to the next level uh, and we, we don't want to just um, leave you with this uh, kind of uh, um, appetizer, you know, to the, to the technical briefs. We are already working in developing a five weeks um, online distance uh, training, as Sarah from GWP has already mentioned. This will be hosted in the UNDP CapNet platform that some of you may be already familiar with. Um, and it will um, be a course that will come with a certificate after successful complete completion of the, of the five weeks. Um, you know, this, uh, some of you may have seen that last week uh, we also launched a similar um, training uh, package online uh, on uh, drilling, uh, professionalization of drilling initiatives that I am after as well. Uh, so this will be a similar methodology. Uh, again, you know, invite you uh, at the end of this uh, presentation to take a look to the website to get familiar with um, the framework and the guidance materials. Especially, we really want to drive uh, your attention into the guidance note on risk assessments and the methodology that we have proposed. As it has been already explained, um, this covers risk beyond uh, climate resilience, but can have uh, can be used. The methodology can be used with a focus on climate. Uh, this is very much aligned, as it has been mentioned, but I want to make emphasis with other um, approaches that the organization is taking to risk informed programming. Um, so, yeah, please take a look and, and try. Uh, and understand how it can be used in your own context, either at the national or subnational levels. The other piece that we really want to drive your attention because it's, uh, we believe it's going to be very useful uh, for you to, to embrace climate resilience in your own programming or advise counterparts in um, integrating climate resilience into water uh, sanitation and hygiene strategies. It's the, the technical brief on what we call on options. This is the one that it's been developed with the Overseas Development Institute. Um, it can be also very useful, you know, to put forward proposals to uh, for climate financing. So we really invite you to take a look to, over, uh, to the overall set of guidance, but we understand it can be a little bit overwhelming at, at first. So if you want to start by focusing on, you know, on the framework with the simplified results framework that we have presented, presented and these two technical briefs, uh, you know, we would be happy to, to see, you know, colleagues very, uh, very familiar with this. We are uh, here uh, to, to support you and support the integration of climate resilience into uh, your WASP programming. Um, and yeah, you can always contact us here in headquarters. Now, uh, we hope that you are a little bit more familiar with who we are and the type of work that we are supporting. 
Um, so with this, I would like to finalize uh, the, the presentation today and maybe take um, uh, if there are some questions that we haven't addressed in the chat box. So uh, one of the questions um, that was posed by Chandler, it was about uh, whether this work is more towards a rural setting or urban setting. And the answer is that uh, from the beginning, we agreed with uh, GWP and our partners that it could, uh, it could be mostly focus on, on rural um, settings, although uh, some of the things that we are presenting can be uh, applied at the, on, on urban. But yes, it's, it's, uh, if you read the introductory paragraph uh, of the document framework, you will see that it clearly states that it's more oriented towards uh, rural interventions. Uh, um, we are, um, UNICEF is part of a newly created alliance on was climate resilience. Uh, it's something that is being formed. It's not really formalized, but we meet um, informally every year during the World Water Week in Stockholm. Um, and the last uh, year in August, when we met, we decided to do a little bit of a mapping of uh, the different initiatives of uh, the different partners within this alliance. So we're in the process of understanding, you know, which different parts of, uh, of, um, of was climate resilience are being supported by the different partners. I'm aware that the World Bank, for example, is supporting sanitation uh, in urban settings. Um, so we may be able, you know, soon to, to try to compare a little bit and, and to understand um, who else is covering for, for other areas. Um, there is also another question that may, perhaps we haven't answered yet in the chat, which is, uh, are you uh, able to talk about examples of UNICEF country offices that have successfully accessed the Green Climate Fund? And then um, I think, uh, Christina, you can, you can try to answer as well. I mean, you have already mentioned about the most famous one, which is the, the case study from Madagascar, who has access, but it's not specifically Green Climate Fund, it's, climate from, uh, finance, uh, it's funding from the Global Environmental Facility. Uh, but uh, I don't think that we are aware of uh, UNICEF, um, you know, successfully partnering with, uh, with um, other organizations to uh, access Green Climate Funds. Uh, Christina, you may know better. Yeah, no, unfortunately, um, we have not um, partnered uh, with anyone yet on, on the Green Climate Fund. There was, um, there has been talk of potentially partnering, um, but um, it doesn't, it has, it has not come to fruition. Um, but we are here to help if people, if, if countries are interested in in pursuing uh, pursuing that route, so please reach out to us with any um, suggestions for proposals, or if you have questions on on who to get in contact with within your country. And also, perhaps uh, Christina as well to say that. Um, GWP, the Global Water Partnership, is also seeking accreditation, and we believe that they may be accredited uh, before we do. Actually, uh, GWP is being uh, optimistic, thinking that they could get accredited by this summer. Uh, and as we are already collaborating over the last few years with, with GWP, and as we've been explaining, we are seeking collaborations at the country level. Um, you know, we could be very happy if GWP gets accredited to uh, put proposals, um, join proposals with GWP to get funding for was climate resilience. This is indeed something that we are already preliminarily discussing with Mauritania country office after a joint mission from UNICEF and GWP. Uh, to see if we can already start, you know, developing a concept, node and, and further um, a proposal, um, thinking that, uh, as I said, that GWP could be accredited too. And I think with this, it's kind of a miracle, but we have arrived to the hour. It's 2 a.m. in New York. I believe it's right now 8 o'clock in the morning in uh, Stockholm um, and the afternoon in Asia. I think if there is no other uh, issue, we will go to bed from our side here in New York. Um, and as I said, you know, um, really thank you everybody for joining. We really uh, hope that this was useful for you. 
um, we can always follow up uh, via email. We have presented a lot of content um, and we understand you need some time to absorb. Um, again, next step big, big for us is going to be uh, developing this online training where we will be able to go, of course, much more in depth into the different quadrants of this framework and also on issues that relate to climate financing. That's why we will develop um, we will develop this course over the over five weeks. So it will have uh, a lot of time to to uh, for you to work on different issues, understand different issues and absorb the information much better. But for the time being, please take a look to the website. It's a, it's a very good resource, we understand, and it can really help you out with, uh, with uh, your programming. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, and we hope to be in touch with you.